welcome to the what has become the annual QCAM uh, awards lectures. Uh, it will be awards plural um, this year. We have two of them um, to, to, to give out. And, and so my name is John Herbert. I'm, I guess, representing QCAM management. Um, and so um, this will be our first annual um, Nick Besley Award. So maybe I should make some remarks um, about Professor Nick Besley. So, so Nick um, was, uh, you know, had had been a postdoc with with Peter Gill years ago, and um, that that was his first introduction to being a QCAM developer. But then, um, for a long time, he had been a uh, independent faculty member running a research group at the University of Nottingham in in the UK. Um, I I met Nick once or twice, but I, I didn't know him very well. But we had so, sort of collaborated on on QCAM things over over track, um, and you know he he did some really nice work on um, on X-ray spectroscopy uh, among among other things, and and has contributed quite a few features to um, to QCAM, including TDDFT in, in reduced excitation spaces, and then built on that to do TDDFT for X-ray spectroscopy. And and unfortunately, Nick Nick passed away in a, in a bicycle accident last last summer. And so we um, we've instituted a second um, what's going to be an annual. Um, award in in his honor and and in honor of of all of the work that that nick did on computational spectroscopy this is the the nick besley award for computational spectroscopy using qchem so so unlike the vormit award which which is largely intended to go for for developer efforts so so some kind of effort on the code um, in principle the besley award could be strictly for for applications, um, but but applications to spectroscopy um, and using specifically using the QCAM code. And so, you know, with that lengthy backdrop to introduce the first annual Nick Besley Award, I'm I'm happy to introduce the the winner of that award, which is um, Florian Matz from uh, Professor Thomas Jagow's group at uh, at KU Leuven in in Belgium. So. Um, let me tell you a little bit about about Florian. Um, Florian got his Bachelor of Science degree at Leibniz University in in Hanover, Germany, in 2018. Um, he did an internship at the University of Barcelona with Professor Alvarez, um, looking at at um, spin crossover compounds, um, and then. Um, more recently, he's completed a master's thesis with Professor Jagau um, at uh, at KU Leuven in, in Belgium, and, and that's what he's going to talk to us about today, I think. Um, and the title of his master's thesis is Quantum Chemical Studies of Electrochemical Aryl Aryl Coupling Reactions in Borate Salts. Um, I know, um, let's see, so. so um, yeah, you know, he's 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 currently I, I, actually what what I what I think he's going to talk to you about today. Yeah, because you 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 can I I can't see the title because I'm reading from from my notes here, but but the rest of you can see the title. Um, and he's going to talk to us today about theoretical treatment of of Auger decay and related processes with non Hermitian quantum chemistry. So what what um what Florian has done very briefly is is, is to to implement these. These theories based on um, complex basis functions within the context of equation of motion, um, couple cluster formalism, um, which which allows you then to study uh, metastable um, chemical processes, and he's then specifically applied that to um, to study OJ uh, processes. And and I should say um, I should have said this at the beginning of um, in, in introducing Shintian, that um, both of these awards, what what happens is is that um, students or or postdocs or staff scientists get nominated, um, typically by their advisors or or by 
by someone else in the QCAM community, um, and then um, and then uh, I, in this case, as a QCAM board member, appoint a, a ad hoc committee of um, of other QCAM developers to then decide amongst the various nominees on, on who the award should be. So I should say that, that I personally had no role um, in in selecting these people. They were they were selected by by other um, QCAM developers. So so with that, Florian, I will turn the floor over to you to present the Besley Award uh, lecture. So thank you very much for the introduction. And I also want to thank the organizers, especially here for creating this nice event today, um, where I can finally talk a bit about my research to people who are hopefully interested in it and to people who are hopefully having some remarks and some feedback to what I did, because this is really important for me. And also, I have special gratitude for this QCAM board to have appointed me as this very first Nicholas Besley recipient, Nicholas Besley Award recipient, because um, it makes me really honorable. It's, I think it, it's the largest honor so far in my career to have received this award and have like the name of Nicholas Besley so close to me. It's really great for me. So thank you for this. But so we not lose too much time. I would like to start with my talk about what I did in this last year about the description of molecular OJ decay with quantum chemistry. So let's first talk a bit about what OJ decay actually is. So may, some of you may not be familiar with that. So OJ decay is a process happening in core ionized or core vacant in general states, usually with light nuclei. And as these states um, are really highly excited versions of the corresponding cation, they can decay via a variety of ways. And one of these is OJ decay, where one valence electron will refill the core hole and another valence electron will be emitted into the ionization continuum, basically. So we get a secondary ionization, often usually leading to a dication. And this happens with a characteristic rate constant of which we call here gamma one, which is the so-called partial decay width. And this is called partial because we have many different ways in which OJ decay can happen. Because we can in principle choose any pair of valence electrons, I mean any two valence electrons to undergo this process. This would be a secondary example. So what you will see here is that since the energies of this target dicationic states are fixed, the energies of the outgoing OJ electrons are also fixed. So they have a one-to-one -one assignment to which state has been formed, which will be helpful in making a spectroscopy out of this. So, but before we look at this, um, we also have this quantity gamma in general, which is the sum of all the partial decay width or the so-called total decay width, and also inverse proportional to the lifetime of the state. So it's also an interesting property to look at for these core ionized states. So why would we be interested in partial widths? As I said before, OJ spectra are basically made by measuring the kinetic energy distribution we get from these outgoing OJ electrons. And there are many different peaks in this, and each of them is like corresponding to exactly one dicationic target state of OJ decay. So these we can basically compute via quantum chemical methods that have been there for a long time, right? We can compute energies of the initial state and the final state, and the difference will be the kinetic energy of the outgoing electron. So the position of peaks is not that much of a problem, but what is the question here is how intense are these peaks? This we can only know if we know how much of this core ionized species is decaying to each of these states. And then the basically the peak area will be proportional to this partial decay width. So these partial decay widths are essential for actually reproducing the shape of these spectra, not only where these maxima are in the spectrum. So what's the problem about OJ decay? Well, in contrary to bound states, like the green one I show here in the bottom, which might be the initial state, like before core ionization, this is easy to describe for quantum chemistry because it's a really classical problem, right? We have a, some electrons, we have some molecular structure, and we want to find the wave function for the lowest energy solution. But what we have in OJ decay is a highly excited state of the cation, which I show here in purple. And this is so highly excited that its energy is actually higher than the energy of the corresponding dicationic states. So this means that over time, the system can lose an electron at the same time we use its energy, which means that over time it will emit these electrons. It's a so-called electronic resonance. And because it's not a bound state, but an unbound state, it's basically also not a solution of the time independent Schrodinger equation, but it's just a collection of states in the continuum, which cannot be described by the bound state quantum mechanics we're usually using. So for this, we need to find some way to introduce this non-bound character, this metastable character. 
um, into our wave function, right? And the solution we choose here is the com our complex variable methods. It's provable mathematically that we can um, introduce this boundary condition of an outgoing electron into our wave function or into our Hamilton operator by using complex numbers in there where usually only real numbers should be. For example, we can use the complex scaling approach where we place or we multiply all the coordinates in the Hamilton operator by a complex number. Due to the mathematical structure of such an operator, this is however only applicable to um, atoms. So for molecules, we have a different treatment we can use, which is the one of complex basis functions. Here basically we can selectively choose which basis functions to, with which basis functions we want to do this, right? And then we introduce this complex number in their exponent. So here you would see the typical exponent of a Gaussian basis function. And if we do this, in any case, we will get square integrable and stationary wave functions. So basically we can solve for them with standard quantum mechanical methods, which are usually made for bound states, like Coupled cluster, Hartree Fock, EUM coupled cluster, basically all of them, and many of these are implemented in the QCAM code. We just have to basically teach our code how to work with complex numbers. And then we will also get a complex number as an energy eigenvalue or energy result in general, which is not like artificially complex, but the real part of it actually relates to the physical energy of the system, while one can show that the imaginary part is proportional to the total decay width of that state. So both of these parts make sense actually. And finally, we have one parameter in these equations, which is theta. Theta is um, the complex scaling angle, also called, yeah, it's called the complex scaling angle. And in the exact theory, we wouldn't, it's, it's basically arbitrary, right? So in the exact theory, the energy doesn't change upon ch changing theta. But exact theory means we have an exact way of representing the wave function, what we can't, of course, do when we use a finite amount of basis functions. So what we do is we try to come as close as possible to this condition by minimizing the quantity dE by d theta and finding the theta that f um, satisfies this um, yeah, requirement. So since we have this covered now, we also of course have to think about which wave functions we want to use. It's clear that for describing OG decay, we ha mainly have to describe the core ionized states which are shown here in green, but we of course also have to include the OG target states in our wave function, which I, sh which I show here in red. You may now notice that these OG target states don't really look like what I showed before, because they are not dicationic states, right? They basically still have the electron in them. But since the electron is excited to a virtual orbital by means of complex scaling, we actually satisfy basically this outgoing boundary condition. And by exciting an electron to this virtual orbital, we achieve nothing else than to describe the electron slowly disappearing from that system. So yeah, this basically what is over this um, in the virtual space here, we can ignore. And then we also have, of course, these contributions that don't, are not associated to GDK, like the blue ones or the purple ones, because in the blue ones, we don't have a refilled core hole, so they can't really describe any decay. And in the purple one, we don't have an emitted electron. And one sees actually when one does these calculations that these blue and purple contributions don't contribute to the imaginary part of the energy, only the red ones do. While the red ones barely contribute to the real energy, this is more in the con yeah, by, made up by all the other contributions. So since these OJ decay channels are basically double excitations away from the core, ion, uh, core ionized state, we take the coupled cluster with singles and doubles method to describe single and double excitations or single and double correlation into these single and double excited states really well. Another method we can use in which we avoid to solve the coupled cluster equations for such an open shell core hole state, which can be difficult at times, is the equation of motion coupled cluster method. In this one, we are allowed to introduce a second operator into our wave function, which in this case is um, the equation of motion ionization potential operator RIP. This reduces the number of electrons in the system by one. And by this, we can start with a completely normal ground state neutral closed shell wave function of this um, system, whatever we want to look at, and introduce the core ionization and the OVDK at the same time. So it's actually quite perfectly made for what we want to do here and describe the um, core ionization and the double excitations from it at the same time. So before I start with my results, I would like to talk to you about partial decay width, which I alluded to before. So the main idea about partial decay width, of course, or like what we have to, what we first think about when thinking about how to describe them is, well, we need some formula which composes the total width from all the partial widths. And such a formula, a similar formula actually exists in the coupled cluster approach. Because in coupled cluster, we can actually write the energy exactly as in this form, 
I show here, and here I focus only on the imaginary part, because in the imaginary part it becomes even easier, as the hartree fock energy doesn't have an imaginary energy. And the single excitations shouldn't contribute, because the single excitations don't describe Auger decay. So we basically only need these double excitation amplitudes and these um, two electron integrals. And by multiplying them, we basically get the partial decay rate. And the nice thing is that in every OG and every coupled cluster calculation, we need to de determine these amplitudes anyway. So it doesn't come at any additional cost to compute these OG decay rates in coupled cluster and the partial rates. Different story we have in other methods. In these methods, this formula is not that easy. So we didn't find yet such an easy approach to it. But what we developed for these methods <clears throat> are the OG channel projectors, which are basically more generally applicable. They are more like a concept. And the concept of the OG channel projector is close to the concept of covalence separations or covalence projectors. Because in the covalence projection, to make some, to, to give a short explanation, covalence projection basically consists in forbidding all these um, contributions to the wave function where the core hole is refilled. And by doing this, we actually don't even get the possibility of any OG decay happening, right? So, and this this is why this this OG channel, uh, this covalence projector is usually used to describe core ionized states with bound state methods. So what I want to do here is I still want to use an unbound state method, but I will still forbid some of these OG decay channels. So for example, in this excitation manifold we have here of coupled cluster or UM coupled cluster, I will take out one of these determinants and solve for all the other amplitudes under the constraint that this is zero. So I only basically decouple one of these core processes in from our, our wave function, our excitation manifold. And by this I get a lower total decay width, which is no wonder because we're missing one channel, right? And the contribution of this channel, I will assign to the difference between this full excitation manifold and this modified excitation manifold. So with that in mind, I'd like to start speaking about some results. What you can see here is some total decay widths we computed with complex basis functions, um, because after finding out which actually which basis functions are necessary and which region of exponents and which energies they must have, one can actually quite well compute these numbers for these first row, first and second row compounds I show here. And these numbers are not only like reproducing the well-known trend that the higher the charge of the central atom, the faster the OG decay happens. They also lie very well in the range of the experimental values and the theoretical values we show here. Maybe to briefly speak about the theoretical values, those are numbers contributed also, computed also with QCAM last year by Wojtek Skomorowski with the FANU EUM CCSD approach. This is also a really nice approach to compute partial and total OG decay widths, and basically it relies on a slightly different concept. It's more like in this approach, we assume a certain wave function for the outgoing electron, and then we try to compute the partial decay width as a some kind of matrix element between these and the bound states. Um, the difference to our with our approach is that it's basically a little bit more black box. So in our approach, we only need to define these basis functions, which can be easily a priori determined for each system. And then we get all these channels on its on their own. So basically we have a little bit less control about what happens, but therefore we don't need to think that much before about what we have to do. But in any case, they are reproducing these numbers quite well, which is quite encouraging for me. So I will not talk too much about these, but um, start directly with the partial width. So here I'll show you, I'm showing you the OG spectrum of the methane molecule. And you can see here both the results from FANO and FANO UM covered cluster and the experimental numbers. And they all basically show the same trend. We have three main peaks, two smaller ones, one larger. And in the experiment, we also see this small shoulder in this main peak. So what I want to do now is not talk about these partial width in terms of numbers, but I want to show you directly how to reproduce the spectrum from the partial widths. So our task here is basically to find out how probable it is that this coordinate state decays in each of these four decay channels. So these four decay channels, one can basically write down on paper without doing a single calculation. We just have to think about all the different possibilities of removing two valence electrons from our methane molecule. What we can't do on paper, but we can do with the couple cluster calculation is just extract from these excitation amplitudes and the two electron integrals, the partial decay width of these states. So we have these four numbers. And what we will do now is we will center a Gaussian peak. We can three, see after this energy decomposition, um, when we center these peaks at the respective 
energies of the Auger electrons, we can explain by means of this, um, the three peaks we see in the experiment, the two lower ones and the main one. And we can also explain this small shoulder in the main peak, which is an effect of this small triplet peak that is not strong enough to show um, in the spectrum as an own peak, but it's strong enough to cause this shoulder. So this is just a simple example, but of course we can do this for much larger molecules and explain much more complicated spectra by means of this um, determination of partial width. So we cannot only do this with this coupled cluster energy decomposition, but we can also use the OGA channel projector for this purpose. So the numbers you see or the results you see here in red are basically obtained from um, solving these wave functions under the constraint of one channel being not allowed. And as you see that mo most of these channels are reproduced really well, only one, the main channel has a de deviation of like a few milli electron volts. So this means that it effectively doesn't make any difference which way we try to um, decompose or which way we try to do to get this partial decay width. So lately, I've been looking at a different approach how to compute these wave functions of coronized atoms. And this is a much easier or a much simpler and much more economic approach to describe excited states, the so-called configuration interaction singles, one of the most, the cheapest methods for excited states coming at the cost of not including any correlation effects. And this really also is known that this method is not able to reproduce any um, valuable energies, but I just wanted to see how close we can get um, when we try to compute Auger decay with, with that. And indeed, if we use this core whole, uh, this valence whole state as a reference, by a single excitation, we can both form the core ionized state as well as a variety of Auger target states. So if you're really attentive now, you will see that we don't have all the Auger target states in this expansion. For example, we don't have the one where both um, electrons come from the second to lowest orbital. Um, this is true, so this is one of the flaws of the CI singles method. It will never include all OG decay width in one calculation, but what we can do is we can go over all the valence orbital, uh, valence hole references, and in some of these, in, we will get all the, at, at some point we will have all the different OG target states. And I lately showed actually that this is possible. We just have to look at all the different target states. And if we then recombine the partial width we obtain from each to one total spectrum, we see something like this. So the purple line here are the results with CI singles. And I would think even though they do show some more deviations than we showed before, some of which are of course due to the Auger channel projector, but some of them might also be to the different wave function. Um, admittedly, there are deviations, but the trend between the different um, peak intensities is really well reproduced anyway. So it's quite impressive, in my opinion, that a method which out, without any electron correlation can describe so well um, this OGDK, which is often also called um, highly a method due to correlation effects or so. So in this case, correlation must really be taken with care and we must really discuss what is actually correlation and how could we describe what happens here? Because this is just simply mixing of single excited states that allows us to describe this OGDK with such a high accuracy. So. In the interest of time, of course, I can't show you the spectra of all the species we look at here, but I think it, somebody should also get boring. So what we want to do here instead is we want to compare these spectra, like compare the trend in the first row of, um, or the second row of the periodic table for these four different central atoms. Um, but it will be difficult to try and do this with the channels we see from these different electronic configurations, because all three of them have, of course, different symmetries. So they have different electronic structure. It would not be really possible to assign these three highest orbitals in neon to the three highest orbitals in water and would be quite a dumb idea. So what we focused on instead was we looked at the similarities and the similarity of them is that they have a distinct inner valence region, which is mainly formed of the 2s orbital of the central atom. All of them are non-degenerate and also all of them have quite a low energy. So they are quite strongly bound compared to the outer valence region. And this will allow some special follow-up processes to happen because a hole in the inner valence region, which can be produced during OG decay, such a hole will still have a high enough energy to undergo a substantial amount of follow-up processes, also called decay cascades. So when we now regroup this partial width according to the outer and inner valence, theory basically, we can show um, how these decay widths behave over the 
these different central atoms. So for example, in the left panel, you see the probability of a core ionized state undergoing this double outer valence decay. So where both electrons come from the outer valence region. And here in the middle, you can see this mixed case. Um, and we think, I think in, in both of the diagrams, we clearly see trends between the different atoms. Um, even though the methods basically disagree in the absolute height of them by a few percentage points, they do show all, for example, that in neon, we will have the lowest share of these double outer valence processes. Um, meaning that on the other hand, we will have in neon the most inner valence holes um, being created after OG decay. So this high energetic or middle energetic, this follow up process in any case, they are more probable in these. And one of these follow up processes is actually the so-called interatomic and intermolecular Coulombic decay. So what you see here is an atom which is basically in the state where it has an inner valence hole, so which could be produced after OG decay. And usually these um, compounds don't have enough energy to undergo an OG decay-like process on their own. But what they can do is they can do this with a neighbor. So the neighbor can be ionized and the energy or an electron is transferred between the two fragments. And then we end up with two monokite ions instead of one dicat ion. And this has been studied a lot lately. Um, it's highly interesting probably for spectroscopy as of course this effect is highly dependent on the chemical environment and also it's for example characteristic dependent there's a characteristic dependence on the speed with which this happens the weight at which this happens of the distance between these two atoms or the fragments or molecules or whatever and this is also why we already started in our group, um, my colleagues started to look at these processes again, because in theory, it should also be possible to describe these with complex basis functions as they are conceptually similar to OGDK. So with that, I would like to conclude my talk today. I presented to you the first time computation of partial OGDK width using complex variable methods. There were other methods before, but we think that these complex variable methods are quite versatile and offer a really black box approach to most of these OGDK problems. We used so far couple cluster, EOM couple cluster and CI singles. And this partial width decomposition code is also working for all three of them. And it will be soon, hopefully be um, also implemented into the main QCAM executable. And we see basically a very good agreement of our results with experiments and both and also the theoretical values from the literature. At the end, I should really point out these are small molecules we looked at here. So we do think that it might be possible to look at much larger molecules. In our group, my colleagues are currently also looking, for example, at ethane or benzene, but I guess we can get even larger if we take um, into account that we can even use com configuration interaction singles, which is by definition a really cheap method. Um, and we can also use, for example, quantum embedding to reduce the cost of um, these calculations by treating the system at a high level and low level level of theory, um, which reduces the cost when we only introduce like the interesting part of the system, the one where OGDK actually happens to the high level region and the rest can be described, for example, with DFT or Hartree Fock and thus much cheaper. With this, I would like to thank my group also and acknowledge their support over that last year, which consisted in a lot of bug testing, a lot of helpful discussions about what needs to be done for OGDK, what needs to be done in the code, because apparently it's very different to describe OGDK in a neon molecule or in benzene. And this is basically what they showed to me over the last year, which led me to more and more improvements and more, yeah, introducing more efficient variants of my code into my, into my QCAM version. Um, finally, I would also thank to the, some external people who have contributed over and over and who we had very many helpful discussions with. For example, Professor Kwilov, also a member of QCAM, and also Dr. Skomorowski, whose interesting works about OGDK have always led me to yeah, new insights about what we actually want to go for. And finally, I'd like to notice the support of the funders and once again thank the QCAM board for having chosen me as the recipient of this Nicholas Bersley Award. Now, thank you for your attention. Once again, excuse me for these technical difficulties and I'm really looking forward to remarks or discussions. Okay, thanks, thanks, Florian. And and no no worries about the technical difficulties, it, it, it happens. Um, I, I, I would like to emphasize that, that this was not the board um, picking you so much as, as, as it was your colleagues from the, from the developer community. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have one question of my own, and then and once again, I, I can't see anything typed into the chat boxes, so I'll turn it over to Quan Yu to, to read the questions from the rest of the audience. But but my question was, um, you know, I, I have a pretty good feeling 
for what size of systems I can treat with normal EOM CCSD or normal CI singles, say. And, and so how does that, that um, change when, when I have to introduce complex basis functions? So I, I understand that the formal scaling is probably the same, but, but is it, you know, does the prefactor increase or does it just get more complicated to deal with and 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 how should i adjust my my thinking about what kind of molecule sizes i can target with these methods hmm. so the formal scaling indeed um is is larger that we obtain and uh, no, no sorry the formal scaling is indeed the same right so we get the same dependency on the system size but you're right we have a different prefactor because basically for every multiplication of two numbers we don't need to carry out only one multiplication, but in principle, we have to carry out four of them because we have two imaginary and two real parts. So basically the, the scaling or like the, the time needed for every multiplication procedure in the code is um, multiplied by four. So we do get a little bit of a larger effort, computational effort, but otherwise the scaling stays the same. So the largest systems we can actually do now with equation of motion coupled cluster would be, I guess, um, benzene or a little bit larger with the current basis set we are looking at, we are taking into account. Okay, thanks. Kuan Yu, are there questions in there's, the chat that I can't? There's no questions so far. Um, Anyone want to type something into the chat? So if if not, you know, I'd just like to say that I, I think this was a, a really nice way to kick off the what will become an annual um, Nick Besley Award lecture. Uh, this is, you know, obviously a hardcore piece of spectroscopy, but but also um, you know a new capability in in quantum chemistry in general and a, a new capability in in QChem. So I, uh, thanks, Lorraine. I, I think it really kind of touches all of the bases. Yeah, thank you for having me here. Okay, then thanks to everyone who um, who showed up wherever you are. Thanks to Florian for coming in and what I guess is probably your evening. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I'll see you, see all of you whenever I see you. All right. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Have a nice day. Thanks. This concludes our webinar. We also invite you to visit us on Facebook. Thank you for your participation and see you at the next webinar.